this is my prompt that the uh, webcast will begin in 10 seconds. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I call the session of the Public Service Commission to order. Secretary Phillips, are there any changes to the final agenda? There are no changes to the final agenda. Thank you. Uh, before moving on to the agenda, I would like to conduct a roll call of commissioners. When I call your name, please confirm that you are present. Commissioner Diane Berman. Present. Commissioner James Alisi. Present. Commissioner Tracy Edwards. Present. Commissioner John Howard. Present. Commissioner David Valeski. Present. Commissioner John Majori. Present. Thank you. So, I know if I speak for all of us today when I say that this commission believes in transparency. Most of our work is done quietly and behind the scenes, and as a result, the scope and scale of that work isn't always readily apparent. One of our roles is to help the public and policymakers understand what is happening with utilities and the services they provide. With that in mind, I will first ask <coughs> Tammy Mitchell, Director of the Office of Electric, Gas, and Water, and Eric Ryder, Deputy Director of the Office of Consumer Services, to provide information on the recent commodity price increases and the associated customer communications. In addition, they'll also discuss Central Hudson's recent replacement of its customer information system and the resulting billing problems. Bruce Alch, Nicola Jones, and Paul Dartmenko are also available for additional support should the need arise. Tammy, please begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Christian and Commissioners. Today I will provide you with a report on the recent commodity price increases and resulting bill impacts. Following my presentation, Eric Ryder will provide additional information regarding utility customer outreach efforts related to higher winter bills and utility billing system issues. Next slide, please. As you know, each year in October, staff provides the Commission with the results of our investigation into the readiness of the state's natural gas and electric utilities for the coming winter, including projections for electricity supply bills, as well as the electric utilities hedging performance and portfolio in place for the coming winter. The utilities' winter pre preparation activities include determining the overall winter weather forecast, determining the forecasted demand for electricity and natural gas, obtaining sufficient supply to meet their customer needs, forecasting commodity prices, and estimating expected customer winter bills based on the forecasted commodity prices. I'd like to ask everyone on a teleconference who's not muted to please mute their call. Uh, there's some background interference. Thank you. Prior to the start of this winter season, and as staff reported in October, the New York Utilities concluded that compared to the 2020-2021 winter season, prices for natural gas would be higher during the 2021-2022 winter season with winter heating bills expected to increase by 21% on average statewide. For full service electric customers, the supply component of the customer's bill was forecast to be about 13% higher on average statewide this winter as compared to last winter. These increases were based on a normal weather forecast. Actual supply prices are significantly dependent on actual weather and other market forces as well as the operational state of the natural gas and electric industries. Next slide, please. In January, February, and March, utility customers experienced significantly higher bills compared to December. The department's review of this issue reveals that the primary driver of the higher utility bills was significantly higher commodity prices than were anticipated. The global increase in natural gas commodity prices is due to various factors, including higher domestic usage because of colder than normal weather in January and into the beginning of February, increased economic activity, and increased international demand for natural gas. Increased natural gas commodity prices also result in increased electric commodity prices, 
since the majority of electricity produced in New York State is produced by electric generators that use natural gas as their primary fuel. Next slide, please. This chart shows typical use full service residential electric customer bills in each winter month at the ma major, excuse me, at the major investor owned utilities. This chart is not all encompassing, meaning several utilities have customers in multiple New York ISO load zones, and customers in these zones are charged different supply costs based on their location. For each utility, the single largest month to month bill changes occurred in February or March from the prior month. For Central Hudson, this was a 43% increase from January to February. For Con Edison, it was a 57% increase from January to February. For National Grid, it was a 6% increase from February to March. For NYSEG, it was a 19% increase from February to March. For Orange and Rockland, it was a 15% increase from February to March. And for RG&E, it was a 14% increase from February to March. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Note, these bill comparisons show the impact of supply price changes from month to month with a fixed customer usage, typically 600 kilowatt hours. However, higher customer usage during the colder than normal weather this winter was also a driver of higher bills in some cases. For example, Con Edison reports that its residential electric customers' overall use increased by 8.4% from December to January. It should be noted that bill increases for individual customers this winter may vary significantly from the average for various reasons. As mentioned, commodity price increases this winter have varied by utility and by region. Additionally, actual customer usage compared to previous billing periods will impact a customer's overall bill. Next slide. As you know, the Public Service Commission controls utility delivery prices through delivery rate cases and other proceedings. Neither the Public Service Commission nor utilities control commodity prices. For natural gas, commodity prices are determined in part by prevailing market prices, but natural gas utilities also use storage and financial hedges to mitigate supply price volatility. Electric commodity prices are determined through a competitive electricity market administered by the New York State Independent System Operator. Electric utility companies purchase electric supply from the market on behalf of their customers and pass those costs through to customers. Electric utilities also engage in hedging practices to reduce the impacts of commodity price volatility on customer bills, which I will discuss in more detail shortly. Next slide. These pie charts depict the components of a typical Con Edison full service residential bill for the months of January and February. The delivery portion of the bill shown here in brown consists of a per kilowatt hour charge, meaning the charge varies based on customer usage, which covers the cost of deliver, uh, to deliver electricity from the point of production to the customer. Such costs include, for example, the cost of purchasing, installing, and maintaining utility poles and electric wires. The delivery component of the bill also includes the customer or service charge, which is a constant monthly dollar amount over a rate year period, regardless of the amount of electricity used by the customer. This charge generally covers administrative and other utility costs that are not impacted by the amount of electricity used by a customer, such as utility meters and meter reading services. Another component of delivery charges shown here in blue are the surcharges for certain programs, such as the systems benefits charge, which is collected to cover the cost of certain clean energy initiatives. For the purpose of this presentation, the surcharge component of the customer's bill has been shown separately, but it is essentially a part of delivery costs. The green slice is the supply or commodity charge, which recovers the cost of generation or production of electricity by independent electric generating companies. As mentioned earlier, the utility does not control those costs, but rather purchases electricity supply for its customers and passes those costs on to the customers. As you can see, due to the increase in commodity costs, the supply portion of the Con Ed, Con Ed customer's bill increased from 24% of the total bill in January to about 45% of the total bill in February. The final component shown here in purple is gross receipts and sales tax, which applies to both delivery and commodity. Next slide, please. 
This pie chart shows components of the Con Edison electric revenue requirement for rate year three of Con Edison's present rate plan with an updated commodity cost forecast. Again, customers receive bills that are derived from two main components, delivery charges and supply or commodity charges. You can see that the delivery revenue components, shown in shades of brown, recover various costs, including depreciation and amortization costs associated with utility delivery infrastructure investment, costs to operate and maintain the system, labor costs, costs of debt, return on equity, and various taxes. As can be seen on the chart, delivery revenues represent approximately 65 percentage points of the total revenues in this period, which is January 1st through December 31st, 2022. Of the total deliver delivery revenues, approximately 22 percentage points is associated with tax taxes, which are outside of the Public Service Commission and utilities control. Although they are generally fixed for a time period, taxes can be a major component of the company's revenue requirement and customer delivery rates. The supply or commodity portion of the utility's revenue requirement are forecast to account for approximately 35 percentage points of the total revenues in this period, an increase of 10 percentage points since the beginning of Con Edison's current rate plan. This is based on an updated Con Edison commodity price forecast made prior to the company's most recent rate filing. Of note, since the time of the company's last rate case, the projected commodity costs have increased by about $1.1 billion due to changes in supply prices. Next slide, please. While utilities do not control market-driven natural gas or electricity commodity prices, pursuant to commission orders, the utilities do engage in hedging practices in an effort to minimize fluctuation in the supply portion of customers' bills compared to market. Electric utilities maintain, on average, a 70% a fixed hedge level for their residential supply customers for the winter season to mitigate market price volatility if it occurs. This current fixed price level of 70% hedge is up from the previous level of approximately 55%, which was in place prior to the 2014 polar vortex. Next slide, please. This graph shows the results of the utility's electric supply price volatility mitigation efforts since December 2008. As you can see, compared to the average New York ISO day ahead market price volatility, which is the red line, volatility of the utility's residential electric supply portfolios, which is the blue line, has been significantly less. Therefore, utilities hedging practices have successfully reduced commodity price volatility compared to the market. It should be noted that hedging practices levelize the impacts of large commodity price fluctuations, but are not intended to reduce overall commodity costs or to eliminate long-term trends or normal seasonal variation. Next slide, please. While utility hedging practices are intended to reduce the impact of commodity cost fluctuations, Con Edison electric customer bill increases this winter were further exacerbated by the design of the company's supply charge mechanism, which is the mechanism designed to recover the cost of acquiring the commodity, including the hedges. Con Edison's supply charge mechanism consists of a weighted average supply rate based on the New York ISO market prices applicable in each billing cycle, a reconciliation of actual expense for the cost of New York ISO supply, and a forecasted hedging benefit or cost inclusive of prior period reconciliations to actuals. Hedging benefits are calculated and established only once a month. The forecasted level of hedging benefits is based on a forecasted market price. If, in a billing cycle, the actual market prices are significantly higher than the forecasted market prices used to determine the hedging benefits, as was the case in January, Customers, bills, customers will experience a spike in their electricity bill. The actual hedging benefits are reconciled in a future bill, and this reconciliation can result in a bill credit to customers, as it did for Con Edison customers beginning with February 11th bills and continuing through March 14th. That said, while Con Edison customers experience commodity price and bill volatility, the hedges that Con Edison entered into saved full service mass market customers over $120 million this winter through the end of February compared to if they were simply subject to market prices. Next slide, please. 
In response to the significant Con Edison bill increases, on February 11th, 2022, Chair Christian, you sent a letter to Timothy Cawley, Chairman, President, and CEO of Con Edison, directing the company to mitigate recent high customer bills by providing the full value of the company's hedged commodity procurements to customers in the subsequent billing cycle and to reassess the company's approach to forecasting its hedge value in billing cycle updates to reduce the likelihood of dramatic and sudden price volatility. On February 25th, Con Edison responded to the chair's letter indicating that the company will adjust its billing process to more closely align with the impacts of supply price volatility. As a result, Con Edison said it will reduce the likelihood of significant customer bill volatility in the future. This past Monday, Monday March 14th, Con Edison submitted an emergency petition requesting the commission allow the company to revise its market supply charge mechanism and in the future will consider other possible changes that can be made to its billing system. Staff will review Con Edison's petition and make recommendations to the commission. Staff will also continue to review utility hedging practices to ensure that utilities are implementing best practices to minimize large price fluctuations. This concludes my portion of the presentation on commodity price increases. I'll now turn it over to Eric Ryder. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. As Ms. Mitchell explained, Con Edison responded to the Chair's letter indicating that it will adjust its billing processes to further mitigate supply volatility. Also, in its letter response, Con Edison stated, it is committed to improving its communications to electric and gas customers to provide better information about potential significant increases in customers' bills resulting from higher forecasted supply prices. Con Ed stated before this winter, it informed customers that it expected natural gas prices to rise. However, going forward, Con Edison will improve its customer communications to specifically address both natural gas price volatility and how such natural gas volatility impacts electric price volatility. Con Edison has committed to improve messaging and provide notice to customers in cases where supply price increases could result in significantly higher bills. Con Edison will continue to provide customers with messages that explain cost saving tips and information on bill assistant programs. On March 1, 2022, the chair sent letters to Orange and Rockland, National Grid, NYSEG, RGE, National Fuel, PSEG Long Island, and Central Hudson seeking their actions to mitigate the negative impacts of rising energy costs to consumers with a focus on vulnerable customers. These utilities were asked to take three specific actions. One, continue to leverage supply buying methods and hedging to mitigate the risk of severe price volatility. Two, strengthen communications to customers regarding anticipated bill increases due to rising energy costs. And three, increase outreach and education efforts to promote consumer payment assistance plans and programs to reduce energy usage. The utilities were reminded to continue to promote all consumer protections, bill payment assistance programs, and energy use reduction programs available to help customers. The utilities were to include messaging using communication platforms such as press releases, newsletters, call center, uh, utility call center representative training, YouTube video videos, and social media posts. The utilities were also reminded to continue to offer customers deferred payment agreements and provide information regarding other bill assistance programs. The chair requested the utilities file a response letter to, to department staff by March 8, 2022, with recommendations to mitigate the negative impacts of rising energy costs to consumers. Herein, I will explain the utilities responses with regard to customer communications and the promotion of bill assistance and energy reduction programs. Each of the previously mentioned utilities responded to the chair's letter on or before March 8, 2022. 
The responses were contained in DMM matter number 22-00346. The utilities explained that they did commence an awareness campaign to customers prior to this winter season regarding projected increases in energy prices and the impact to customers' utility bills. Such communication included emails, bill insert, uh, bill insert newsletters, standalone bill inserts, social media posts, web banners on home pages that link to dedicated informational pages, web alerts that pop up when customers visit the website, digital signage, and radio advertisements. The utilities continue to message to customers and provide a range of programs that offer flexible payment terms and meaningful discounts, such as deferred payment agreements, payment extensions, level payment plans, and the energy affordability program discounts for low-income customers. The utilities have continued, or excuse me, the utilities have communicated to customers the availability of bill assistance programs, such as the Home Energy Assistance Program, Emergency Home Energy Assistance Program, Regular Arrears Supplement, and the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. In addition to the outreach methods just mentioned, the utilities trained their customer service representatives so they would be prepared to provide customers with information related to higher winter heating bills. Customer service training included talking points for rising natural gas commodity prices, energy conservation, and assistance programs. In response to strengthening communications and increasing outreach and education efforts, the utilities are increasing the frequency of messaging on multiple communication channels, including letters, social media with links to bill assistance, hosting webinars, bill inserts, website messages, and dedicated web pages, press releases, and providing additional training to call center reps, which PSEG Long Island, for example, is sharing with its local elected officials to assist them with constituent conversations. National Grid, for example, is planning a financial literacy webinar for later this month geared towards low-income customers. The webinar is intended to support low-income customers who receive the, arrear, the residential arrears supplement but are now falling behind on their energy bills. National Grid, as an example, is transitioning its winter heating season customer communications efforts into a broader bill assistance campaign called Here to Help. It is expanding its community outreach partnerships to faith-based communities and state and local consumer protection agencies. With that said, there are areas where utilities can improve future communication with customers. The utility response letters to the chair do highlight differences among the utilities in types of communication channels. In addition, most of the utilities' pre-winter communications were focused on natural gas supply increases and, and there was less of a communication focused on electricity supply increases. Going forward, customers need to be educated on the linkage between natural gas and electricity prices and the impacts to their bills. Moreover, specific messages can be generated during cold weather events or price spikes to provide customers warning of potential higher bills. Staff will work with the utilities to update and improve their annual outreach and education plans due to be filed April 1st. The next topic I will brief the Commission on is Central Hudson's replacement, recent replacement of its customer information system and the resulting billing problems. By way of background, Central Hudson's legacy mainframe customer information system was about 40 years old and was designed and built in the early 1980s. The mainframe served key functions such as account management, customer billing calculations, service and rate information, customer information, and payment and energy usage data processing. The company proposed to modernize its customer information system in its 2017 rate cases. 
at that time, Central Hudson stated that the customer information system was originally developed to handle basic rate designs and bill routines. New complex rate structures and regulatory requirements required significant manual billing. There was also a lack of personnel needed to support the legacy mainframe system, and the le legacy system could not automatically generate bills for customers enrolled in community distributed generation projects, net metering, hourly pricing, time of use rates, and other more complex billing scenarios. Back bills were also gener manually generated by customer service representatives, which created additional work and increased the probability for errors. The commission approved the replacement of the mainframe system with a new customer information system project in 2018. Central Hudson began the conversion to a new cloud-based customer information system in early 2020. Prior to the new customer information system going live, the company conducted outreach via letters, newsletters, social media, and its website, which also contained a special web page for energy service companies. The new customer information system went live in September 2021. And in November 2021, Central Hudson notified staff that bills were not being sent to many customers mostly customers with complex, complex billing transactions, such as being enrolled in a community distributed generation project or served by an energy service company. The department also began receiving many calls from frustrated customers. Moreover, customers were assume, assigned new account numbers, which led to customer confusion despite outreach by the company in the months prior to the conversion. Staff continue to, continues to monitor the billing situation through frequent communication with the utility, with daily updates and biweekly meetings. Staff has reviewed Central Hudson's outreach and draft notices that are sent to affected customers. Central Hudson mobilized 40 internal employees to address the back, billing backlog and 50 contractors to answer uh, phones in October 2021. The company added 75 more contractors in November and December and 39 additional contractors to assist with its parallel strategy of eliminating billing defects and manual billing to ensure that um, all bills are corrected by early April 2022. Some customers who have not yet received a bill or who are disputing their high bill because of high supply prices are filing quick resolution system complaints with the department. Central Hudson's complaint volume has grown, causing the company to increase its complaint resolution staffing by 300% relative to normal operations. The company stated it has identified the problems within its new customer information system and is working with its implementation vendor and software engineers to resolve the problems. Central Hudson acknowledges that approximately 7% of its customers, or 21,000 customers, mostly customers that are specially billed, are still facing billing difficulties. Central Hudson has estimated it will resolve the issues by early next month. The company continues to send notices via via mail and email to affected customers to explain the billing problems and to notify customers about large auto deductions from their bank accounts. Affected customers received or will receive multiple bills in the same envelope. For impacted customers, Central Hudson suspended late payment charges and is offering no interest payment plans to customers who are unable to pay their new bills in full. While staff has indicated to the company that their focus and priority should be to fix the billing problem, staff is in parallel investigating the root cause of the billing problem. Staff also plans to fully examine this issue in the Central Hudson Management Audit. If staff's investigation finds violations of the public service law or other imprudent actions by the utility, it will inform the commission as soon as possible to take appropriate action 
with recommendations on next steps. To date, we are not aware of inaccurate bills, but we are closely examining whether that may be an issue in addition to the bill frequency issues. This concludes the presentation and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Eric. I want to appreciate you guys taking the time to put this presentation together and share this information. Um, I think you've done a great job of highlighting the various factors uh, affecting customer bills um, and documenting what is influenced by the market and what is under their uh, control and can be managed through commission action, to regulatory action. Um, I, I think it's important, and, and it bears pointing out, that the price spikes we've recently seen is not something limited just to New Yorkers. Uh, this is a global issue, a national issue, and it's affecting everyone from Maine to California and everywhere in between. Um, customers already struggling with a global pandemic are now faced with rising inflation, rising energy costs, and concerns that the war in Ukraine could uh, have far greater impacts in the near term and long term. Um, as noted in your presentation, uh, we've instructed the utilities to increase their outreach efforts, and I'm optimistic and looking forward to seeing the results of that increased outreach. Um, I want to uh, thank you for documenting the different steps each of the utilities are taking, and uh, you know, I, I'm encouraged that we'll be in a position to better communicate these issues both as a commission and through the utilities to customers and minimize the potential impacts we'll see in the future. Um, I see this as one of what will be many information sessions where we'll be talking about bill impacts to customers, um, uh, particularly the opportunities for reducing those impacts and also the risks, um, things that could increase those impacts over time. Um, so we'll likely be having these conversations again, Tammy and Eric. Um, with respect to the central Hudson billing problems, you know, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of staff's investigation. Um, I know that's already underway, and thank you for sharing the information you provided thus far. Um, hope we'll, we'll see where things go once we have all the facts and take whatever action is warranted at that time. Uh, so thank you for your time today. Uh, with that said, I want to open the floor to commissioners. Do you have any comments concerning what was presented today or recommendations for future discussions along these lines. I'll start with you, Commissioner Berman. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, address this in sort of two buckets. Uh, first, uh, to uh, Tammy. Um, I um, found out yesterday that we were going to be doing this presentation and I thank the chair for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I am still struggling with what exactly is um, the message that I want to send. Um, I'm not going to ask you questions per se, but I'm really going to give you what I hope to be my thoughtful um, perspective. Um, I think it's really, really important um, that we carefully evaluate um, where we're going and how we are addressing this, not just for this um, season, but um, for the future. Um, this is not unique to this winter. This actually feels very much to me like Groundhog's Day um, going back to the polar vortex of 2014. Um, I even remember May 15, 2014, being a part of a technical conference um, looking into um, very much uh, drilling down of remedies and the path forward on what we could be doing to never have this again. Um, and looking at what some of the challenges were, supply constraints, hedging practices, better collaboration, better outreach to consumers, um, better education, stakeholder engagement, um, working with the um, industry, ensuring that um, we are better prepared, um, ensuring that we look at um, uh, um, 
uh, all of these different things. It's always very important, um, things that we are critically important. For me, it's also what is the role of the commission? What's our responsibility? Um, and what's our accountability, um, both as a uh, commission body, but then as our um, body in giving direction to not only the staff, but to the utilities. Um, I am sort of reviewing uh, and looking at um, not only um, the letters that went out to each of the utilities, but the letters that came back. Um, and I'm struck by really all of the letters have similar um, sentiment. Um, some drill down a little bit more, um, but overall uh, they all sort of stuck to the four corners, um, which primarily kind of came up with what I see as the core uh, issues, which is that the issues are really related to um, the sharp higher prices are due in part to colder weather, higher usage, constrained domestic pipeline capacity, a recovering economy, increased energy and demand nationally and globally, and um, for many, more reliant on natural gas for electric power generation since the closure of Indian Point. And then looking at hedging and storage um, and you know, with withdrawals and dealing with all of those different issues. And then talking about how, what they're doing with um, educating um, the public and then also saying, and please let everyone know that we have nothing to do with um, the commodity end of things. For me, I keep coming back to what's our role. And our role really is providing and ensuring that we are adequately prepared to meet the reliability needs of customers for now and for the future, and to make sure that it's affordable. Affordable for who? Who determines affordability? Who pays for that affordability? How do we ensure that we're making sure that it is? We're planning for that. We're planning for it in a way that, again, goes back to reliability. The reliability makes up a whole host of things from a safety perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective. All of these different things fold into it. And so that takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of planning, and it takes a lot of understanding of the technical capabilities. And that means that it gets a little sticky. And it means that we have to have some honest conversations. And we need to have some honest data analysis. And it means we have to have some honest, true analysis of the cost. And then we need to come together and we need to figure it out. It doesn't mean we need to dictate. It doesn't mean we need to mandate doesn't mean we need to be the ones to say, you must do. We need to figure it out. It's going to take a lot of work. And it also means that we need to be able to work together. And it means we need to call out others, some other state officials, who may not fully understand. We can't just say that we have to educate consumers. I can tell you, if I was a consumer who had my checking account or savings account getting an auto withdrawal, and I have overdraft, and it, all of a sudden money was coming out that I didn't expect, I would be devastated. And for those who can't afford it coming out, I can feel that pain. And we have to do better 
as a commission in understanding that in real time and responding to that. And we knew that in 2014. And we knew that in 2015. And it goes on. And so somehow we have to figure out all of those different issues. And I know I'm bleeding into Eric's issues on the consumer services stuff. But it all kind of folds in together. Because when we talk about educating on the linkage between natural gas and electricity prices and having to educate the consumers on that, I can go back to the winter presentations where we have not, at times, been willing to talk openly in a public session about natural gas in a way that makes that direct linkage, in a way that openly talks about it. We use other words. We talk about it in a way that somehow seems to make it seem like it's all OK. Supply constraints. What are supply constraints? What will happen next winter when the supply constraints are even more dire? What will happen next winter if the supply constraints are more dire and the colder winter snap happens? What will happen? Hedging is not the main issue. We can hedge. We can fully hedge. We can make our utilities hedge completely. It's not a get out of jail free card. Hedging is not a free. It's an insurance policy. And an insurance policy is costly. It's a risk. And we have to understand that. The hedging policies back in 2014 were rejiggered and discussed. It's a mechanism. It's something we look at every year. We evaluate. We work with the utilities. And we make adjustments as necessary. We're going to be looking at the emergency petition and adjusting to try to help offset this. But that's for this winter. What do we do when it's not just about the winter prices? What do we do when it's about the cost from the clean energy issues? What do we do when it's about next winter and you can no longer fully hedge? Or what do you do when you can't keep hiding it? So all of that, and, and what do you do when now you have to address the hidden insurance policy costs and all the other things? So for me, I look at this, and I'm blessed with really good staff in terms of all of these things we have. I'm happy that we're talking about this. I'm happy that the chair is giving us this opportunity to raise these issues. But I'm really, really concerned that we have a lot of work to do. And we have to come together and acknowledge that that work is going to be hard and sticky. And ensure that when we're talking about making sure that we are educating folks. It encompasses all of us and everyone, not just the utilities, not just the customers, but every one of us. We all have a lot to learn, including myself. Pulled up some EIA statistics. I love EIA. And it shows that just capturing a lot most recently, and EIA has a lot of weekly reports, and they reflect a lot of the pipeline constraints from Pennsylvania into New York and from New York into New England. And it talks about the spot market prices and evidenced in higher heating bills. 
and a lot is offset a great deal by LDC hedging. Um, and it's also, there's a moderated by switching to lower priced oil. Due to lack of pipeline infrastructure and the closure of Indian Point, not only are prices up, but CO2 from the electricity sector emissions are way up in New York because of the oil burn from electricity, at least my layman's perspective of looking at the EIA statistics. And the CO2 emissions, now this is from the EPA, not EIA. In e EPA's news release in 2021's news release showed that CO2 emissions from power plants were up last year because of an increase in coal generation, partly because of higher natural gas prices. And, natural, and then forecasting, EIA is forecasting natural gas prices for the remainder of the year to remain near $4 per billion P BTUs in 2022 and slightly lower in 2023. So when we talk about the linkage between natural gas and electricity prices, we have to have also the facts and continuing looking at these statistics and what does it mean, especially when we're looking at that natural gas demand is gonna continue to be there. And when we're looking at supply constraints and what this means in terms of emissions and if CO2 emissions are going up, and if people are gonna be going to coal, people are gonna be looking at oil, what are we, what does all that mean if we're also focusing on renewables and actually we're, we're not helping ourselves if some of what we need is the supply constraints to be lessened to help us with our renewables that we're trying to do. So some of that can be some of the conversation that we bring to the table to help us in alleviating some of the stress in some of those conversations. Customers are truly feeling the pinch, the burden of higher energy prices. This comes in addition to um, increased prices for food and other goods and services and is outstripped by increased wages. The longer term trends looks to be higher electricity and natural gas prices due to pipeline constraints in our area, globalization of the market for natural gas and disinvestment in natural gas production due to a number of factors, including pressure from decarbonization policies. However, it looks like, and this is important, that the long term trend for non-fossil alternatives is going to be higher as well. That scares me. Due to sharp increases in the prices for commodities like nickel that are essential to many of these technologies. Given these trends, we have to carefully examine the costs imposed by clean energy programs. We have to look at that. Are the incentives and subsidies in each program able to be adjusted as appropriate? Is the federal government going to be giving New York its share? Given higher prices, on the market, if the costs of non-fossil based technologies are also rising significantly, can customers afford to pay both higher prices for traditional resources and higher prices for alternatives? We're looking at increased costs for utility services across the board, increased material, Labor costs will be manifest as different points going into the future. But we understand that investments are crucial and can't be avoided. We need it for public safety. We need it for reliability. I don't mean to be controversial that those that hold out the promise to allow customers to take greater control over their energy consumption and service reliability, especially given electrification pro policies being advanced by the current administration, investments in smart grid applications and advanced metering are going to be critical if our entire economy is going to be run by electricity, both for utilities and for customers. We have to face that reality. We have to look at what those costs are. 
There's a lot of focus on accelerating depreciation and that we should be doing it right away. Looking at the studies and depreciation studies, it's going to be another upward pressure on rates. We have to address that if we're doing it faster. It's going to be huge. There's been a big focus on low-income customers and mitigating any increases, and that's important. There's a um, working group, a statewide working group on um, EAP, Energy Affordability Policy. It's ongoing. Um, we should be having more information on that. That policy for low-income customers, the energy affordability policy on the more than 6% of the overall income, uh, should not be more than 6% on utility expenditures. We have to look at that. We should be looking at what that means for non-LMI customers, um, commercial customers, because they're also feeling that. What does that mean? And it's not about then lessening it for low-income customers, but maybe it's about also figuring out what the right equity is in also having some kind of cap. I don't know. At some point, we have to recognize that the increased rate impact, people are just not going to accept that anymore. <clears throat> I guess my message for Tammy before I pivot is that I am truly concerned. I would like to see as we go forward that the focus isn't on the near-term fixes, even though that's important, but on us truly trying to have much more information in real time on the ramifications of not addressing these supply constraints and what it would look like if we're on the same pathway and if we were looking at this with a significant cold weather and a significant issue next winter. <clears throat> As we move now to Eric, and thank you so much for um, consumer services and the work that you do. I am looking at it, though, from a different perspective, which is <coughs> I do believe that it is not so much about the focus from what we're facing with Central Hudson, which is important, but really just an overall perspective of the complaints that come in. So obviously the challenge is the high bill issue. Um, now, there's also in this letter, uh, in the letters that came in, there was a lot of focus um, from the different utilities on uh, what they're doing for customer outreach. At our uh, October session, uh, as traditionally, we had um, information on what people were going to be, what utilities were going to be doing in outreach to uh, their customers. The thing that I'm struck with is I, 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 seem to, I seem to feel that we ourselves, we, the commission, um, 
and maybe maybe just more just focused on figuring out a way of tapping in more to um, re reaching and feeling more that we have more accountability in reaching more customers ourselves and understanding. I, I will point out National Grid gave some statistics in theirs. I appreciated that. I felt it gave me more information. Um, it gave real numbers. It gave more information on that. And so for me, it's also about having some true understanding of exactly what we're looking at. Um, when we look at the issue with the computer glitch, which um, uh, Central Hudson is acknowledging is an issue, I, I would like, uh, it doesn't have to be now, I would like some more clear, specific information on exactly what we're, what it is, and that does not just mean from um, the Office of Consumer Services. That means our accounting folks, because this was part of um, uh, an approval from uh, you know, the rate case. So for me, it is about understanding. This isn't about a blame. This is about our understanding how to fix that, and also understanding again. Um, as you said, there, there's, we haven't, you have not yet found that there's been actually any, um, uh, uh, I forget what the word you use, and I want to make sure I use the right word. Inaccurate bills, right? So it is clear, it is it, very important that we work with Central Hudson and the affected customers to resolve it and help them resolve it as quickly as possible. That means that we need to be engaged as well and triage with them and, and work with them to do that, in my opinion. Um, and also to pull out from that because it is confusing, because it is, it's, there's a couple of buckets there. There's the computer issue, but then there's also the high bills from um, just the winter issue, right, and the commodity issue from in Tammy's presentation. And then there is the um, issue with, um, with the CDG issue, which is seeming to be not just Central Hudson issue. There's at least one other utility that seems to have that issue. I would be interested to know if it's not just now two utilities, and so we should be doing a little deeper dive across the board to see if it's just contained with two utilities or if it's deeper than that. And that also means to me that we get ahead of it and resolve it as quickly as possible so that any affected customers, whether it's one customer, 100 customers, however many customers it is, and how, whether it's two utilities or more than two utilities, we resolve it ASAP. And we also make sure that we are clearly identifying exactly in that framework because it's confusing to everyone what they're looking at. And I also would say that um, we work with the um, local officials and the banks that are connected to these customers that um, are ha are had the glitches um, to help them in perhaps resolving any of their um, auto uh, withdrawal issues that there might be. Any way we could be as helpful as possible, um, we need to go above and beyond in doing that. Um, that's sort of where I come from with that. As to the management off audit, which is separate from this, um, the management audit is something which is our bread and butter. Um, it is something that we 
are doing, it's on the consent agenda, assuming that it passes, we're approving um, the RFP selection of the um, uh, auditor um, from the prior order where we agreed to do uh, issue the RFP. To the extent that it is now wrapping in the look at um, this part of the, the billing issue, I just have a little hesitation on that because the auditor itself is an independent auditor that reports to the commission. Um, I just want to make sure that we are not overstepping into the audit function of the auditor that is doing a management audit and that we are not then, um, you know, inappropriately, perhaps unintentionally, pushing into that. For me, it's important that they actually uh, look, they actually may find some system processes that can be helpful to us in terms of how we operate and maybe um, can help us with our own um, processes and communication in sharing with the commission. Um, but I just want to make sure that we are very uh, careful in this approach um, and so that it's not a directive that um, uh, becomes complicated in that fashion. So um, the other issue I would say is that we have um, a number of complaints with OCS that deal with how are we triaging, how are we resolving, what do you need um, as a uh, uh, office to make sure that uh, you have th what you need. Um, there's a lot there. Um, I know that your folks work very hard on a lot of complicated issues, um, handling uh, crisis management, and I appreciate um, that. The other issue is there are a lot of pending proceedings that we address um, that become important from a regulatory relevance, a regulatory certainty, regulatory clarity, and a regulatory prudence. Um, for many of these issues, the consumer issues, the supply commodity issues, the rate issues, all bleed into all of these pending proceedings because all of it is important to how we manage our substantive um, operations here. So I thank you very much. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Berman. Uh, and I'll go to Commissioner Alisi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, first, let's acknowledge, uh, I would like to acknowledge the good and thorough job uh, that the staff has done. Uh, we always appreciate their professionalism and good work. The utilities have uh, laid out various roadmaps for uh, significant improvements, and hopefully we'll see what uh, successes they have that will ultimately benefit consumers uh, in the very near future. And uh, I think it should be said that uh, we can all agree that broadening the lines of communications, as the chair has called for, uh, will have significant value not only for consumers, uh, but for the companies themselves. All in all, I think this is a very thorough and good job, and uh, thanks to the staff for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we'll now go to Commissioner Edwards. Yes, thank you very much, Chair. I, um, I'm struggling with this because, you know, it's, it, it says in the documentation, and while I understand that, um, you know, the Public Service Commission or utilities control commodity prices, it is our mission that we have the broad mandate to ensure not only access to safe and reliable service, but we have talked probably every commission meeting about just and reasonable rates. Uh, you know, it doesn't say 
just and reasonable delivery rates. It doesn't say just and reasonable rates, except if the commodity pricing is out of control. You know, so for me, I still believe that the buck stops with us and with the utilities. Because, you know, at the customer level, they are still expected to pay these costs and to have some a family to go from what is expected to be a 13% increase, which is bad enough, to a swing up to 57 to 67% is just unacceptable. And, you know, while I see that the utilities did do some work on informing customers in advance, they clearly did not do enough, which is why they are providing additional means of communication. But even if they communicated to the customers in advance, you're still expecting the customers to pay a very large amount of increase that many customers will struggle to pay if they cannot, if they can even pay it at all. Um, you know, having low income programs is great, but if you are not eligible for a low income program does not mean that you can afford to pay a 57% electric bill increase across January to March. You know, you just, you cannot do that. Um, you know, I didn't hear that the utilities were providing a disconnect moratorium. I didn't hear that they were going to take the increase and spread it out over a range of months or years, quite frankly. Uh, I do think that there are additional things that can be done and should be done in order to care for this, you know, but I think it is our responsibility, you know, I do. Um, this is, this is not, this is not good. You know, it is, it's not good. And we have to figure out these billing issues. Um, we have to be informed, I believe, more timely. I think the customers are bearing the brunt to a lot of these uh, missteps that are just, it's not acceptable. We, we should not be, we should not be accepting it. It has to be, something else has to be done to prevent this from impacting the customers on a going forward basis. And I don't, I don't think it's appropriate for us to be distracted on other things that we have responsibilities to do. I want to squarely look at this particular issue at the customer uh, level to see what we could have done in order to control it better because there is a large swing um, and I don't expect, I don't accept the weather argument either. You know, we have bad weather all the time. So if we're not, if there's a swing of 57, 67%, and if we're utilizing weather as a justification for that, then we are not doing enough in terms of emergency preparedness and weather planning and, and whatever. It's these these bills are not sustainable, uh, and I definitely appreciate the communication uh, to us. But we need to take very clear actions with the utilities to make sure that we're doing everything that we can so that it doesn't happen again. Otherwise, we're going to have this happen again. And the customer communication we revisit with different utilities to way too often. So possibly we should be setting a standard of what the communication should be and roll it out to all of the utilities because they're consistently changing the customers are on the end of it. And if we think that, you know, bill inserting a bill insert 
is enough to say, by the way, your bill is going to increase by 50%. That's not appropriate. It's just not. There should have been robocalls. There should have been a letter. There should have been customer service contacts going out to inform the customers. But again, even if they knew, expecting them to pay this amount of an increase and then saying, well, if you're low income, well, suppose you're not eligible for low income. You know, I, um, this hedging practices, it, it, it's more has to be done. And I think more has to be done at our level to be uh, much more informed in terms of this supply charge mechanism, the, the billing issues. Um, but I, I see this as us. I don't see this as just commodity pricing, because again, I'll end where I started. Our mandate is to ensure just and reasonable rates, not just the delivery rate, it's rates, and I don't think that we can punt, and I don't think that that's what you're asking us to do. So I just think that um, we have to do more, I believe, on this particular issue with clear recommendations, with timelines and owners, so that we are in fact protecting the customer from this volatility. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. <clears throat> Commissioner Howard. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank you personally uh, for conducting this informational session. And as you indicated, we will need many more going forward. The lack of transparency around the issues dealing with utilities and uh, and all manner of utilities, how we pay for our current system, how we need to pay for the new system, and the hiccups along the way. Uh, if we are not the body that will provide that transparency, I'm saddened to say I don't believe anybody else will. So to that end, thank you very much. Um, a couple things that jump right out at me uh, to Tammy's presentation, which was excellent, thank you. And it's the issues of what can be done in the near term to help folks. What can be done in the near term to help folks? Uh, despite uh, Commissioner Edwards, and I understand where she's coming from, and I have great sympathy, we do not control the world's commodity markets. We do not. Natural gas is now a national and internationally traded commodity that has to get to places, comes out of the ground, it's a finite resource, and the prices are going to go up and down. And now we know exactly, with some precision, what it means not only to our heating bills, but what it means to our electricity bills, since it is the prime driver. Um, so there's not, unfortunately, this body is not going to be able to do much about that in the near term. However, there are other aspects of Tammy's presentation where others, not this body, could do immediate and meaningful bill reduction for customers. I am struck with Tammy's presentation on the Con, con Ed total costs of doing business. When I calculation, 17 cents on every dollar that Con Ed collects from its customers goes to the city of New York in property taxes. That's just one tax the city levies. Additionally, they levy a sales tax and a gross receipts tax. So the city of New York's responsibility uh, to customers' bills in, their, in Con Ed service territory is nearly 25% of your bill goes to not paying for Con Ed's services, doesn't pay for the energy that comes over their pipes and wires. It goes to the city of New York in general revenue. I have seen no one, either in the state level or the city of New York, particularly as they are developing their new budget for this year, saying this is something that is unacceptable. The city of New York today, the city council, could do two things immediately to provide immediate rate relief to customers, and I believe they could even provide retroactive relief to customers if they take their own revenue 
requirements and deal with them appropriately. For those, so that those folks, particularly in uh, who espouse a different type of con ed, a publicly owned con ed, that won't change the dynamic when 25 cents on every dollar that they collect goes to taxes, not to providing service. So that's number one. Number two, there are, it's not just Con Ed, although it's the most gross uh, uh, example across our state. There are a variety of taxing jurisdictions, school districts, counties, cities, that put on extra taxes to their uh, utility customers. They could take immediate action on their level to reduce bills. And the reason I say this, I, there's great interest right now on reducing motor fuel taxes. There are active bills in both houses, and the administration has indicated their willingness to, to do something on motor fuel taxes. At $5 a gallon, uh, motor fuel taxes imposed by New York State are less than 15% of the cost. Less than 15%. Contrast that to Con Ed, where its total tax load with state and federal numbers are in excess of you know, 28 29%. So again, there are mechanisms that people need to know about. The problem is with utility taxes is that they are hidden. There is one portion of your bill, the 8%, right, Tammy, that will show up on people's bills, the sales tax and the gross receipts tax. That's on your bill. The 17% of your bill that goes to taxes is embedded in your bill. You don't know that it's there. So again, uh, there has been great debate in the New York City Council and others about the need for uh, massive and real real property tax reform for the city of New York, dealing with a myriad of classes and how they uh, assess properties of various classes. I strongly recommend that the city of New York tackle this, their four-tier tax system on real property tax as particularly as it relates to utilities and they need to do it and they need to do it right away. The other thing is not only do we need to do it right away but part of our plan for a green economy will be billions of new dollars of infrastructure built particularly in the city of New York that will only compound that. If we have this new rate structure we put in billions of dollars of new capital expenditures, that will mean just a quote-unquote windfall for the city of New York just for this pass. And then who pays? Utility customers will pay. And I think we need to take a strong, not us, unfortunately, would it where we could, but I think both the city uh, government and the state government needs to take a look at that and need to look at it right away. And remember, these taxes that the city and localities put on, they are permissive meaning that the state legislature gives these localities the permission to levy these taxes. So they do have a role in fixing this problem. Um, one thing uh, we can do in the near term, uh, I think, and I'm very heartened to see that both houses of the legislature have put significant money uh, in their one house uh, proposals for, to cover utility arrearages, and I applaud them for that. However, it is really important, really important that we do this efficiently and learn our lessons from last winter and ongoing and how not to do it. And I'm also gratified that both those proposals give this department, the Department of Public Service, the ability to administer those dollars that will get uh, effectively uh, put in to customers' hands right away. And I also trust us to have a very sharp pencil that this doesn't result in any potential windfall uh, unintended to the utilities themselves or their shareholders. This is about preserving, helping customers get through this difficult time. Um, so to that end, I hope that a final budget agreement has uh, DPS in charge of those funds. Um, one question I have is that we commodity drove this problem. Uh, I have noted with a, and maybe Tammy, you can hand it, or Cindy or somebody can just say what you view the change in commodity prices just in the last couple of days. It seemed to be dramatic. Uh, is is that the case? Yeah, I mean we're definitely seeing 
commodity prices going down. I mean, but as, you know, Tammy has indicated earlier, it happens every spring. The weather causes prices to go down. I mean, I would also say that, and you probably will see this in various EIA reports, as Commissioner Berman referred to earlier, I mean, producers in the United States are going to step up. If they see that they're going to get, you know, $4 or 450 for a million BTUs of natural gas, they're going to do everything they can to produce more. So they will very much respond when called upon. And while they've gone down at $4, it's double what it was two years ago. So uh, while we enjoyed the benefit of very depressed prices, uh, the sick, the cycle came and bit us. Um, to get to Central Hudson and uh, some questions on I have on uh, billing. Uh, first of all, what concerns me is this is very expensive. These what Central Hudson has charged ratepayers to put in these new systems was really, really expensive. Which is when you pay high prices, you expect good service, <laughs> and. Eric, you know, the, the, that concerns me because it appears that every time that a utility has changed billing or metering uh, infrastructure, we've had these glitches going forward, and uh, they seem to be a pattern. And I, I just hope, particularly as we have a couple utilities upstate, Nysigar, g and &E, and uh, Niagara Mohawk, poised to do a similar modernization of their metering and billing systems that we don't have these problems going forward that they are wholly unacceptable just unacceptable Con central hudson mit mit missed these metrics by miles they weren't even in the ballpark um and these issues of complex billing with more community uh solar community uh, distributed energy or self-generated rooftop or a variety of other uh, time of use stuff, how are we doing, and we are getting ready to do managed charging for electric vehicles. All of this are going to require a working infrastructure that customers get what they pay for. It's extraordinary, you know, that uh, this. And while it, this commission approved these expenditures, we want to see performance along with that expenditure. Um, because our entire system going forward is going to be more complicated, as Commissioner Berman pointed out, with electrification of buildings, uh, uh, electrification of our transportation system. All of these things are dependent on IT systems at the utilities working properly and on behalf of consumers. Uh, I think uh, it is something that this commission needs to pay much more attention to it often is the black hole of rate cases is this IT expenses big number boom it is very difficult for staff I think to fully evaluate the request for these very complex IT systems when I don't want to say that what we know and what we know but I do think we do have to acknowledge the limits of what we do know and there may be things particularly on going forward uh, a variety of a new approach on how we evaluate IT systems going forward. And as I note, will note in the Con Ed filing, it is a boatload of money for new IT systems, particularly regarding uh, cybersecurity, which uh, is absolutely, as we now know in this last two weeks, better than we ever have known how important that is to, to reliability. But I do not believe that we have the in-house expertise to fully evaluate those expenditures in a, in a meaningful way. I don't necessarily have a suggestion at this point how we ought to do it, but I know it is. it will be critical going forward, and particularly uh, in light of the failures of utilities as they've instituted new billing and metering practices. It's just uh, we, we can't screw this up again uh, going forward. And uh, to just one comment on C Commissioner Berman's comments, customers aren't going to care what is driving their bills up. They don't care whether it's the commodity cost. They don't care if it's taxes. They don't care if it's clean energy investments. They know their bills went up. 
and uh, we are now seeing the the two irreconcilable differences backing each other. The desire for customers to have low cost and the current mechanism by which we finance uh, improvements, uh, particularly on zero emission stuff, which is all on bills. We do, and I desperately, desperately call on both the state legislature and the Congress again, we can't afford this energy transition focus solely on customers' bills. And it is, a, if we can't afford this seasonal geopolitical blip that we have here, we're talking about new costs that are permanent costs to the system going forward that are quite honestly unknown. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I do count on you that we move forward with eyes wide open and that we tell customers and uh, the economy writ large what these new initiatives cost because we're going to pay for the old initiatives and we're going to have to pay for the new initiatives. And um, so that going forward, price transparency is, is critical. And uh, I think customers are far more aware of what their energy bills are today than they were even 18 months ago because they were not as big a part of their uh, bills, uh, household incomes. But now they are. And as we move forward, it won't matter. It won't matter if you can't afford your bill because it went up because of clean energy investments or commodity increases or tax increases. We just know that that affordability issue becomes critical. And it's not just, as Commissioner Berman alluded to, not just residential customers. Our basic economic competitiveness, both within the United States and across the world, will be dependent on us getting this right. So with that, uh, and thank you, uh, Eric and Tammy, as always. Uh, but again, uh, I think, and I call on those outside of this body, to take immediate actions that can reduce utility customers utility bills today or in the very near term so again thank you with that mr chairman thank you thank you commissioner howard uh commissioner valeski uh, thank you chair howard thank you for um having this item uh on the agenda today appreciate it very much I i'm going to be very brief um for one reason and one reason only a uh, number of the, of the points that have already been made, uh, I certainly agree with, and, there, and there's no reason to be repetitive. So I'm just going to make a, a, a quick comment, a specific comment, Tammy, to your presentation, and then maybe a question to you, Eric. Um, Commissioner Berman uh, raised an issue that, that I think is, is um, well, there's many issues that are important to consider, but one in particular, the effect, and, and not for today, Tammy, but going forward the effect on this issue of the removal of Indian Point right and what effect that has going forward and I don't say that to relitigate any decisions that have already been made but clearly for some period of time until uh, renewables eventually fill that gap um, I think it would be helpful to know I'd be very interested to know um, uh, the removal of that from the, from our generating system what effect that has had, um, you know, going forward. Eric, ju just one, one question for you. A um, number of commissioners have mentioned um, earlier, certainly the ability to pay or the inability to pay extends well beyond those who qualify for low-income programs. Um, I'm sure all the utilities have budget plans. I'm sure all the utilities to some degree or another market those budget plans. Do we have any, again, not necessarily for today, but do we have any data information um, that shows numbers, uh, um, how many ratepayers participate, um, uh, and what that, what that effect can have other than obviously smoothing out some of these, some of these blips? Staff can certainly gather that information and provide it to you. Okay. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Commissioner Majori. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as uh, Commissioner Valeski said, uh, there are several points that have been raised that I'm not going to reiterate. Um, I 
I do want to say a couple of things. The first is I, I don't have this distilled into a specific question, but I do want to signal something that uh, in coming weeks I'd like to try to get a better understanding of. And to some extent, I think we have to see sort of how events play out. But I, I am looking to get a better understanding on the effects of uh, global events on commodity prices and how long term those effects are going to be. And I, you know, I, I'm presupposing that part of the answer has to do with uh, how long the global situation will be uh, unpredictable. But that is a, an area that I seek to have a better understanding of in, in coming weeks. Now, assuming that there isn't a good answer to that sort of very broad question right now, I'm going to move on to my second point. But interrupt me if, if uh, you want to add anything or respond to that. Um, second point is relevant to one of the issues Commissioner Howard brought up. And just as a general matter, something that is going to be very present in my mind in, in future decision making is when we're adding the costs to rate payers outside the context of a rate case, the question that I'm going to be asking is, is there a better way if we're trying to implement a state policy for the state to pay rather than um, uh, deferring uh, the cost to uh, utility bill. Um, also related to something Commissioner Howard pointed out and often points out is I'm struck once again by the uh, impact of property taxes uh, on the utility bill. Um, so property taxes are other governmental entities raising revenues through utility bills. And the question that I, you know, I asked to some of our colleagues in other forms of government is, are there other ways to raise those revenues that are both more predictable and better aligned with the ability to pay? Um, I, uh, I am, uh, I'm struck that um, property taxes charged to utilities are a backdoor way of charging property taxes, often to thousands of people who do not pay property taxes directly. Um, and, you know, a similar argument could be made to ch charging property taxes to uh, landlords, but you have a choice in, a two, in, in uh, what type of rent you pay, whereas it's less conscious um, to determine uh, what you could do to avoid uh, higher, pro uh, higher utility bills because of the property tax charge for the utility. Um, so it's just it's a point i wanted to raise i think it is similar to something commissioner howard said but I, I just wanted to put a finer point on that and um other than that i do want to thank you very sincerely for the presentation and for chair christian for arranging for this i do think that this you know absolutely is, um adds to the transparency of of uh, both this commission and dps in general and it adds to my understanding so i i greatly appreciate the presentation thank you very much Thank you, Commissioner Major. Okay, and uh, thank you again, Tammy and Eric. Uh, with that, I'd like to move to the consent agenda. Uh, do any commissioners uh, wish to comment or recuse from voting on any of the items? I'll start with Commissioner Brown. Thank you, because I used up my allotted time and discussion. I'm gonna be very short. <laughs> My self-imposed a lot of time, just be aware. Um, on 163, I just want to say um, a shout out and thank you to the gas safety staff who worked tirelessly on this matter. I really just want to say on a personal note that you all are making a difference and I personally thank each and every one of you. Um, on item 369, I'm a no, consistent with my no vote on the February session February, yes, okay. Item, um, items 374, 375, and 376, uh, I'm concurring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Elise? Uh, piece of consent agenda, Mr. Chairman, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Edwards? No comments at this time, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Howard? I have no comments. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Commissioner Verlesky? No comments. And Commissioner Majori? I, yes, I, I would um, like to signal that I'm going to, uh, uh, I'd like to comment on item 369. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank staff for spending a considerable amount of time with me uh, uh, in my efforts to understand this order. 
Uh, I understand that the project developers have agreed to fund environmental projects to mitigate adverse impacts from facility construction and operation as part of the Article 7 process. And uh, while I understand and agree with this basic concept, what I find concerning here is the lack of information in the record about the supposed benefits from the accelerated payment schedule requested in the petition. Uh, one of the groups represented on the Trust Governance Committee, committee did issue public comment in support of this order. I'm appreciative of that. I would have liked to have seen more information in general, but also I would very much have been interested in the views of other members of the Governance Committee. Uh, as it is, I get it, as per the petition and the accompanying resolution from the committee, they think that accelerating payments will help advance the goals of the trust, but I don't have a full understanding of why they think that. For this reason, I seriously considered casting a no vote at the same time, there is no information in the record about how granting the request can do any harm. In the absence of such argument or information, uh, I'm going to vote to concur um, with the results, but I wanted to note my concern. And on all other items, I'm going to vote uh, in the affirmative on the consent agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now I'll do the call for the vote. Uh, my vote is in favor of the recommendations of the consent agenda. Commissioner Berman, how do you vote? I vote yes, except for those I noted already. Would you be so kind as to note them again, please? Uh, yes, I vote yes on all except 369. I vote no. 374, 375, and 376, I concur. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Edwards? Oh, sorry, Commissioner Elisa? I vote yes on, I vote yes on all items. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards? I vote yes. Great. Commissioner Howard? I will be voting yes. Commissioner Valeski? I vote yes. And Commissioner Majori? I vote yes on all items except for 369. On that item, I vote to concur. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, the items are approved and the recommendations adopted. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Secretary Phillips, uh, is there anything further to come before us today? There is nothing further. Thank you very much. And with that, I adjourn today's meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.